Welcome to the future of XYZ. Today, we are going to be speaking about the future of JEDI, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And really, we are going to be talking about what the future is for in terms of Black women and their role in bringing up everyone in the community, all of us together. And I am joined just really amazingly by Marianne Howland. So thank you, Marianne, for joining me. Marianne is the founder and CEO of IBIS Communications, as well as the Global Diversity Leadership Exchange, which is facilitates dialogue among um, senior leaders, executives, NGOs, et cetera, around the world on topics of diversity and inclusion. She's a storyteller for social change above all, a recently named chair of the board of the American Sustainable Business Council, as well as chair of their working group on race and equity. Marianne, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. What a wonderful introduction. Absolutely. And I'm oh, happy Friday indeed. <laughs> so I think that the thing that we're gonna start with is most people are not gonna be familiar. I mean, maybe I'm ignorant, but which is possible. We'll find out today how ignorant. But the, the thing that most people aren't gonna be familiar with is the term Jedi because most of us had D and I and now DEI and we're just getting used to that. And now Jedi, which makes a lot of sense. But can you talk to us about what is Jedi before we start getting into anything more about the future of Jedi? Yes, and, and you know, it is a journey, isn't it, <laughs> in this work? And so JEDI is the next iteration or next level of DEI work. The acronym stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I think the best way to kind of tee this up is to give a little bit of history of the terminology and, and the sociology of the work. So um, back in the 60s, in the, during the civil rights movement, one of the outcomes of that was affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And so you had companies and uh, government and, and uh, um, entities uh, totally committed to sort of bringing black people into the workforce, creating opportunity, creating education opportunities, and that was great. And so what happened along the way is all of this uh, work being done to include black people turned into a lot of litigation and lawsuits because of discriminatory practices because folks didn't have a clue that when you get into the workplace that you don't call them the N word. So that led to diversity and diversity meant <laughs> that there was some training that needed to happen. So then there was a whole cottage industry that blew up around diversity training. Yeah. And that diversity training um, inside um, mostly corporate offices then morphed into, and I, and I remember being a part of this movement because I'm a communications expert and a language expert and the way the term diversity kept getting used when they refer to, and still today people say this, but that thinking about hiring someone of color, they'll say, I need a diverse candidate. Right, it's still there. It's still there, it's, isn't it? It's a, it's a weird word, right? It, I mean, cause it's, that's an inaccurate use of that. It's, it's not an adjective to be used like that. <laughs> so, which, so when I began working with my clients in this space, I shifted the language and say, it's about inclusion. If you, if you are, if you include, that's the process, you achieve diversity. Right, so then, yeah. then that became this diversity and inclusion language to, that sort of described this work, right? I think and that's then, so it's, it's, it's actually just to interject, it's so interesting because that training in the diversity and in the inclusion really has to do with African-Americans largely and dealing with unconscious bias. But it also, of course, I mean, just to put it out there, it has to do with you know, nowadays it's like the gender identities and the religious freedoms. And it also has to do with having five generations of people in the workplace. But at its core right now, it's really, I mean, it's, it's about race. But Lisa, but you bring up a really good point. And I'm so glad you said that because that was the goal 
of the work that I was doing with clients to use the word inclusion. Mm -hmm. because, when, because that helped you to be able to broaden your pool for sourcing for talent or engagement or whatever to include as opposed to exclude. So Absolutely. if you just include, then that, that altogether means anyone. People with disabilities, veterans. So it, it just, it made the table wider, right? Yes. So that was the goal of using that language. So thank you for pointing that out because I, I think that that's really critical. And it's that, really uh, critical. And the industry shifted, right? Because it, went, it expanded, because I know as an agency, we were, the first work that we were tapped to do was to reach the African-American market. Yeah. And then, and then it, then it was the, his, it was then called Hispanic. The Hispanic <laughs> Latinx. Market. Right, now it's Latinx. And then it was the Asian market. And then it was Native Americans now, indig indig indigenous. And then it was, right, right. And then it was uh, the next, then it was women. And then it was uh, people with disabilities. So in other words, it just kept the, and so our, our ad budgets, we would get add-ons for each individual market that we were trying to bring into our inclusion strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that work evolved into DEI because what people began to recognize was that, okay, you can bring people in the organization and do all this inclusion, but we also have to deal with pay equity. We also have to do with opportunity, right? Advancement, right? So suddenly folks started being challenged by another rounds of litigation <laughs> of why- the, Ameri the American way. Right, right. We're gonna litigate it into, <laughs> into the business, right? Around um, disparities, right? Yeah. And then, and then uh, transparency and being, you know, companies being called out began to realize that this was yet another, the next level of the work in, in DNI was this equity, closing this equity gap. Okay, so it's really, in, in, that equity gap is a, is a, is a key one and, and, and it's where a lot of companies still are and I'm all for staying in that lane because it's so critical because if we can solve for that, you can close a lot of gaps. If you can close that wealth gap, you can close the health gap. You can close the education gap. You can close a lot of gaps at, you know, when well, you close It's the really where the rubber hits the road in many ways. Equity is what is the manifestation, is the action and the result of having inclusion, right? Yep. Yeah. So we are now into Jedi. Yes. So the justice aspect is policy work. In other words, one of the things when I referenced the civil rights movement, which the, the result of that was this um, very intentional conscientious effort to sort of level the playing field in terms of, oh, we'll spread some money around and we'll create opportunity. But that, and that lasted for about 20 years, but then what started to happen? We started to slip back. All of a sudden there were no more scholarships available. All of a sudden, you know, the hiring practices began to devolve, right? And so you don't see, you know, people of color in management levels, women not in management, those kinds of issues started percolating. So the justice component is about policy. policy. Because if we had back in the civil rights movement, state got dug deeper into policy, the same way that redlining created home ownership disparity, the yep. same way that Jim Crow, policy. So we need policy that that undergirds all and of this intentionality around diversity work. I think it's so interesting because it under the policy undergirds it, but policy also combats the, you know, to go into it is the systemic racism is about the inequity, the inequality, the gap of opportunity in housing, healthcare, work, employment, right? I mean, everything basically. And that has been systemic. And so policy is how you kind of start breaking it down instead of the onus being on the individual and or the organization, right? Right. Fascinating. So, so here we are. So, so 
And in the past year, for example, um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to also co-found something called the Jedi Collaborative which is an initiative that came out of the natural products industry and um, rec them recognizing the role that they play in a critical air, um, part of our economy, the food industry, and, and which is so important when we think about health and wellness. Of so they got the import of that, really wanted to dig into how do, we, how do we make a change? How do we have impact? And knew that there needed to be some work in this space. So that was the impetus for coming together in this collaborative and, and, and that's where the Jedi formulated that is now in the zeitgeist because everybody's talking about Jedi. Jedi. Literally from that initiative. That, what a great, smart team of people. Which is so cool. And I, and I just have to comment. I mean, last week we had on the show, uh, we were talking about food labels. And we were talking in part of that is like, you know, what the push towards transparency in food labeling is. But there's this, you know, we're going to start taking for granted in the luxury of being able to eat. And yet when we talk about Jedi, there are so many, it is a luxury to have simple ingredients, to be able to have clean label, et cetera, right? Like this inequity, again, comes to that gap in just food. So Jedi in the food space is, is the basics at the bottom of the Maslow's pyramid in some ways. Girl, we can have a whole nother conversation about that. I, you know, um, there's so many, oh my, the food, the food industry on so many levels. Um, has so much um, opportunity for being involved in change and so much to be held accountable for. Absolutely. So you know, that's, that's, and we'll, we'll, that's, that's, a, that's another future XYZ conversation. Exactly. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the, the future of Jedi. I mean, what is, I mean, I'm gonna start big and then we can kind of fill in the pieces. What is your hopeful future? Like what does the future look like in terms of Jedi? Well, that's a, that's a really big question. And I think that it's one that I, I'll say it's one of optimism. And the reason why I say that is because there's a reckoning that is happening across not just America, but around the world right now for um, addressing systemic racism. And I think the future of Jedi, the justice component is nested, nested in this concept of overcoming systemic racism. So, and, I, and because there is so much um, intentionality around doing this work and, and frankly, interest and desire, you see it from many of the companies, not only involved in the Jedi Collaborative, but you know, who have stepped into um, the work at, you know, you know I, I often have to brag about like Ben and Jerry's and, and you know, the way that they just leaned right in with, a, with not only doing the work and they've been, they're authentic about it because they've been doing it for years, but their mission statement didn't say we stand with Black Lives Matter. It said, we want to end white supremacy. That's hardcore. That's, that's bringing it. That's, that's bringing, bringing it. Right. But, so, and, and to your point, they have always talked the talk and walked the walk. And so they've just leveled up because they've always been trailblazers. And if the trailblazers aren't blazing trails, no one can follow. So, so I, in, in my work with all these companies around, right now, Ben and Jerry's is my gold bar. That I, I just think that, you know, if, if, if companies need to strive and understand and study what it is that brought them this far. And I, you know, another company, and I just talked with yesterday, uh, Joy Bergstein, who's the CEO of Seventh Generation. <laughs> and they've embraced Je Jedi. And, and, and it's been remarkable what they've been able to accomplish in just five years of committed, not to say that they weren't always had a sensibility, social responsibility, but they've changed, they've taken social responsibility into social significance. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. What, so what, what I find so fascinating about those two examples, just to call it out, they are both CPG companies that were independent owned, are now owned by Unilever, and both are in the middle of nowhere, Vermont, the whitest state in our country. Thank you. Right, and, which is fascinating. And, right, and hats off to Unilever. Because Unilever is, is really, you know, so they're, you know, um, I'd say at the front, you know, 
join the forefront of leading the work that is truly transformational globally. So I'm, you know, so that that gives me hope. So when I think about the future of Jedi, I'm with them, <laughs> you know? Um, one of the other um, aspects of the future of Jedi is the future for Black women. Yes. I think that, you know, last night, as I shared with you before we got on the, got, you know, went live, um, I, when we, I knew we were having this conversation and, I, and, and we had not yet identified what the conversation was going to be. So folks watching, this is all just happening as we speak. Um, the ellipsis filled in for me was Black women, the future for Black women, because we're having a moment where people are beginning to recognize the many um, contributions, the talents, the value of Black women as leaders. And, and so there's, there's a, a, a word of hopefulness and opportunity. There's also one of caution. And the, and the reason why I, I want to make that distinction is the word of caution is, before I go to the good news, the caution <laughs> is, again, going back to the civil rights movement. So right when, you know, when this moment of opportunity arose and suddenly black people, because that was the first focus, were the recipients of um, the benevolence of, of, of a new society. The money. Right. Black women were the first to receive the scholarships, the first to be hired because we filled double quotas. And so what began to happen is a trajectory was cre created for the success of Black women. Mm. Meanwhile, we had Jim Crow, uh, you know, uh, Jim Crow and mass incarceration and, and, you know, all of the elements still in place to oppress Black men. So while our Black men were still going to jail, you have women, so, so th there was an imbalance in yoking. So you have women who were extremely successful in our pool of men as our mates and as our fathers and brothers, all of a sudden. So, now, so then you created this whole community of- um, Inequality heads. within the community. Right, and, sing and, and single heads of households with these women who are now you know, bearing the burden of you know, children to their family and, and meanwhile trying to make a career. And it, it, it's so insidious. And, and it's one of those things that doesn't get talked a lot about, but I am, I'm one of them. I am a successful single black woman. There's a small pool of black men because as I got, you know, more successful, th there was this imbalance that was created. Well, it's so what, because, because the education gap is something that actually has been happening for the same period of time because of affirmative action and its role in women. Women have been being educated at greater lengths. But as you said, the double quota after the civil rights movement for black women, it nailed it in two places. And what's so insidious about what you've just said that really I, I kind of hurts my soul that I have never thought about, even though I've done some, you know, work with amazing organizations and criminal justice reform and stuff, is this gap actually flips the traditional role, right? In the African-American community, it's traditionally a matriarchal society and yet very machismo. And you are actually exacerbating those stereotypical roles and inverting them so that the community is actually, it, for, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, but so that the community is kind of against itself in some ways and 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 pulled apart at the seams. Yeah, yeah. Well, it definitely has created a lot of challenging social issues within our community, and I think that you know it's it's it you know we've been wrestling with them, and it and and while you're mired in that conflict, it also kind of takes you you know removes you from you know being able to marshal all of your talents and gifts towards a, a common goal for all, right? So that's why I'm saying it's it's insidious, you know, it, when you- It really it. is. Yeah. And- And, and so, thought out, it, it seems. Right. It, it really does, think, does feel that way. I'm glad you agree. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think that, um, so for, for our own Black community, I think that a mindfulness around, you know, us- you know, trying to make sure that we are also working 
to raise our young men and bring our men along um, on this journey and fight for that is really important, which I see happening. So that's encouraging. Now, the good news is in the future for Black women and why I think you see so many companies and organizations tapping into Black women right now, I'm, I'm beginning to see a bump in the number of Black women on boards. And by the way, if anybody is looking for somebody, I'm you know, throwing my hat in the ring. Love it. <laughs> and then, but also for um, roles as CEOs or senior level management teams across the country and, and, and the world. Absolutely. And so um, what, that, what that is saying is that people are beginning to recognize that because we're, we're, we're the most, but African-American women are the most highly educated of all groups. We've had more college education probably because of that work after the 60s, right? right? We got more PhDs than, you know, anybody else. So we've got education. We also have a dynamic work and life experience that we just described. So you're bringing a lot of skills, multitasking, you know, innovation, leadership, because resilience that we've had to marshal all these years to, you know, uh, for a number of reasons. So all those are now being realized as valuable. And so it's an opportunity for us to um, take these leadership roles and be effective. And now with our, you know, girlfriend Kamala Harris. Uh, right, I was just gonna say, and now our new, our new Veep. I mean, how amazing. Right. right, who's also a soror. So I just think that, you know, um, yeah, it, it's a moment that I'm very excited for us that we are able to actually realize the many gifts that we can bring to the table. And um, so I'm optimistic. Also, you know, I think that it's a moment of innovation because, and I was, I just did a, a seminar with a marketing uh, organization a couple of days ago. And, you know, in, in, in marketing and advertising, and, you know, you're always looking for the next great commercial, right? The next great message. Well, what is, what is marketing and advertising but storytelling? It is storytelling. It's just storytelling. Yes. So when you look into the BIPOC experience, which like in a way that you've never looked at before, there's some incredible stories. Yeah. I mean, we, and they're new, right? These are all going to be, I mean, it's an opportunity to find really new stories. And a really wow. excellent example, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you chime in because I'm just excited about this commercial. I think it's, it's Amazon. And the commercial is about um, a little, a black ballerina. And she's, she's in school and she's practicing, practicing, looking for- It is her. Amazon and it's, it, it made me cry. Right, okay, so there you go. And, yeah. and the, the beauty of that story is that while anybody can relate to it because it's all about perseverance and you know, it's lovely, but for African-American, black and brown people, that's, whole, that's next level. I mean, okay. that, that was so deep that, you know, I had to recover. You know what I mean? I was like, oh my God. Right. Well, so, I think I think that this is the interesting thing. And, you know, we try to or I, I hate to do this because we always try to keep them like under 20 minutes. And I and I and I there's so many things like we haven't even talked like we're talking about marketing and the and the storytelling aspect and opportunity, which I love you bringing up as a marketer myself of of being able to incorporate stories from the BIPOC community that are authentic and true. And so there is a lot of levels that need to come to the fore. We can't tell people's stories unless they are true. I true. And, that's, and, my, that's my premise. But the second the, thing that you talked about, oh sorry. The second thing that you we haven't talked about, which is interesting, is the movement, like let's just call it, you know, Black Lives Matter exploded in 2020. I mean, it was started obviously in 2013 with Trayvon Martin and this nightmare in Florida, you know, and then that happened in 2014 and it's gone on. We've seen way, way too much of this, right? And and it, it exploded on the scene this year. And, and I don't think that's changing. And that's why this conversation is progressing as rapidly and why the policy and justice piece is so timely. But if we think about all of these things, that need to happen in order to realize that future vision that you so beautifully summarized, right? As being optimistic. What, it, it can, it, can you leave us with like a few things that you think we all can do at, at a micro and macro level? Listen, I think it's a good time. 
read, get educated, learn the history. So I always like to leave people with a couple of my favorite books that I've read recently that I think are eye-opening, where I even learned something new. One of them is Begin Again by Eddie Glau Jr. I just think um, that, which is a, um, a, a retrospective of the, of the career of James Baldwin. So it's, it's, the, it's the Black experience through his eyes, but with Eddie's, you know, very uh, visionary and brilliant, you know, um, um, you know, uh, academic acumen brought to it as well. So it's really a, a very good read. But along with that, just reading, oh, in my book, Warrior Rising. Yes, uh, which is amazing about your beautiful son. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. So, so I think, which is about the Black experience, for real. So I think that, um, you know, reading and getting educated about the, the true history, the, the unwritten history that you don't get taught in school, and then listening, you know, taking the time to listen to more people and, and that and listening means also inviting people into the room. So, you know, it, it's one thing to just listen amongst yourselves. It's another thing when you, you know, take the time to diversify your table and then listen to the stories. That's where the genius happens. That's where the innovation and creativity happens. It's, it's awesome. And if you and if you know your history, you can have fun in the conversation as well. You can people bring up a reference point. And you go, oh, I know what they're talking about. I remember that. Right. Yeah. This is this is fantastic, and I think it all summarizes really nicely with the future of Jedi. Um, and and the the it's really about the future of opportunity for everyone, right? I mean, it's about leveling the pay, playing field, and and that is, I mean, you know, rising tides lift all ships is. Um, and it's about time that we take some concrete action to make sure that all ships rise equally, because that's just, it's, it's long overdue. Okay. I'm with you. I mean, I'm preaching to you of all people, but, um, you know, I, it's, I, 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 I don't know anyone who's listening to me who doesn't know I feel that way also. So I am so, I mean, just honored, Marianne. I wish we had 40 minutes. This is, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll talk about something else next time, you know, racism and food systems and all the rest of it. But thank you profoundly for joining us on Future of XYZ. And I look forward to, uh, you know, everyone's feedback and uh, engaging in the conversation, listening um, and getting informed. Well, thank you for inviting me, Lisa. This was totally enjoyable. And there's like five or six other conversations you know we can have because I can talk, as you can see. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It is a pleasure. Thanks, Marianne. All right.